We later asked Dr. Gomella to expand on the approval of enzalutamide as a treatment for men with chemotherapy-naive or metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and his use of abiraterone versus enzalutamide in a newly diagnosed patient. We now have two drugs uh, that are improved uh, oral agents in the pre-chemotherapy and the post-chemotherapy space, both abiraterone and enzalutamide. And the enzalutamide was just approved in the pre-chemotherapy space uh, in September of 2014 uh, based on the PREVAIL study showing approximately 29% uh, improvement in uh, survival of these men. So when you make a decision uh, between enzalutamide and abiraterone, a lot of it comes down to uh, the, the clinician's comfort level with the drug. Uh, there are some subtle differences between the two. Abiraterone does need to be used with prednisone, where enzalutamide does not require the use of prednisone. Uh, some of the monitoring issues, um, you have to uh, monitor uh, liver function tests, for example, and uh, potassium levels with uh, the uh, abiraterone because of the risk of hypokalemia and hypertension. Uh, there are some contraindications which are on the label for abiraterone, such as very severe liver uh, insufficiency. Um, enzalutamide actually, oddly enough, only has the contraindication of pregnancy uh, when you look on the label. However, there is a, always a caution with enzalutamide. Uh, there's always a lingering concern about seizure risk, and although it's not been a recent problem, there is some early data that suggests that patients who do have a prior history of seizure, uh, you should have some caution in using enzalutamide. So I think at the end of the day, what happens is each physician has a comfort level of using the different medications and they try to look at some of the specific characteristics of the patient in deciding which agent to use. Recently there was a study looking at something known as the ARV7 splice variant. Um, there was work done at Johns Hopkins looking at circulating tumor cells and the presence of the splice variant was able to determine whether or not abiraterone or enzalutamide had a good clinical response and it turned out that the splice variant was present the drugs did not appear to adequately interact with the circulating tumor cells in this particular study, therefore suggesting that the presence of the splice variant may indicate these drugs may not be effective and you may want to go to another agent. This is very exciting because we're getting down to the level of precision uh, medicine and we, the best we can do is try to predict the patient's response to these different drugs. So having a marker like a ARV7 splice variant as a, uh, a responsiveness or lack of responsiveness marker for these agents is very exciting and hopefully at one point will find its way into routine patient care uh, as, uh, as larger data sets become available and validate these findings. What's happening now with all these new agents that we've had approved the last uh, three or four years, uh, what order do we use them in is going to be one of the, the, the big questions to ask. Certainly using things like the ARV7 splice variant to decide uh, strategies, yes, no, for a uh, oral uh, hormonally reactive agent or using a chemotherapy will be important. But another unanswered question that we're slowly getting information on is the issue of the, the sequencing of the drugs or the potential for using drugs together uh, in combination. And I think there's been very limited studies so far of this, but there are some larger trials that will be looking at uh, the combination of abiraterone and enzalutamide, uh, which will take many years to uh, get the final results of, but at least it's being looked at.